as a tool to understanding complex cardiac problems. And there is no better person than Dr. Balbir Singh to elaborate on this. Letting me present what I want to show you. So I'm going to show you something uh, not very unusual, something which is uh, we see in daily practice. So I'm going to pick up some cases and show you. And ECG is such a thing that every one of us and each one of us wants to learn, wants to see. And I'm going to use that as the basis of how to diagnose complex problems. So one problem that you see is acute coronary syndrome, myocardial infarction. So, and there the ECG is extremely relevant. The, some of the questions that come to your mind is, shall we stent or shall we not stent? And this question is on everybody's mind because there are question asked by our legal systems was your stint necessary now this is a poster in america where uh, a lawyer has said was your stint unnecessary and has given his number so that he can law put a lawsuit so this is the question that we are going to answer by the ecg let's look at a 73 year old uh, gentleman known case of chronic kidney disease Serum creat is 2.3, uh, so we know that we have to be careful. Presented with epigastric discomfort. And unfortunately for us, uh, this patient got admitted under the nephro unit because the creatinine was borderline and he was known CKD. Now he comes with epigastric discomfort. But fortunately, the nephrologist did order an ECG and a troponin analysis. Now this is the ECG of this patient as we dwell further we learn however this got did not come to the notice until the troponin value came in so this was the ECG which gives you a lot of clues you see V1 there is a right bundle branch block pattern this T wave is inverted which is fair enough there is a R prime so you expect this T wave to be inverted uh, you would see elite 2 3 AVF show a pattern of an Q com QS complex and then an R. But if you look at AVR, AVR is one of the neglected leads. If you look carefully at AVR, we see there is an ST elevation. And the other thing that is remarkable is you see some kind of an ST depression in V5, V6 and there is sinus tachycardia. So this all indicates that something is brewing. Now this right bundle branch block could have been in past and this may just be not a new phenomena but it could be a new phenomena but this ST which is going up in AVR does connote something that we must look into and this is the troponin value which was got two hours later to be 18.6 and look at this range so it is far far higher clearly telling you that this patient uh, needs urgent attention. Now we have got the ECG we have got um, the troponin value so how do we decide his creatinine is 2.3 and now he's looking better but how do we decide whether we should take this patient to the lab or we should not take this patient to the lab if we go back to the ccg the presence of sinus tachycardia right bundle branch block st elevation in avr tells you there is something serious if you go to this value this is really high so this tells you that things are not good now on your Mobiles, you can get download this app, which is the Grace Score, which really helps you to decide which patient should actually go to the cath lab, so that you can avoid unnecessary stents. So this patient underwent uh, Grace Score, which was pretty high, which suggested uh, that it was needed to catheterizing. So what do we want the ECG in acute coronary syndrome to tell us? It should diagnose. It should prognosticate. It should decide whether we want to go for an invasive strategy or a conservative strategy and effect of reperfusion therapy in such a patient. Now this patient underwent a coronary angiography uh, the same evening. Uh, this is the right coronary artery, you would see a tight stenosis here. This is the obtuse marginal which is quite big, the tight stenosis here and look at this LED. It has got a very tight stenosis and there is a septal which is coming down like this. This is the first septal. And this is the cause why this patient had right bundle branch block. This lesion starts right at the septal. You see the septal, 
Now this has been stented, this LED has been stented and you see the septal coming down like this. This is the septal artery which is arising from the occluded segment and is the cause of right bundle branch block because septum is one supplying the right bundle. So the septal artery is supplying the right bundle. So if you have involvement of the sept right bundle, you know there is involvement of the proximal LED. You don't have to think, really do not, things are very simple actually. God has made things very simple for cardiologists. So if you have right bundle branch block with acute ischemia, uh, it has to be very proximal LED. And this clearly shows that the LED was proximal. This is after the stent. This obtuse marginal is after the stent. So this uh, was clear that I just implanted two stents. Creatinine was 2.3, so I didn't bother about the right. So after these two stents, look at the ECG. Uh, the right bundle is gone. The sinus tachycardia has settled completely. These T waves have got inverted, indicating actually reperfusion has happened. They, they, they are not a bad sign, they are a good sign, telling you that the reperfusion has happened. This ST in AVR is clearly uh, settled now. So, this was a good acute reaction to this. So, what do we need to determine from this ECG? We need to determine the ST segment deviation score, more the ST segmented, which are the segments that have. What is the pattern of T wave inversion? What is the specific ST elevation? Now, we have six limb leads, and six limb leads can give you a lot of answers. They are extremely important leads. You should imagine this is one of the neglected leads, and AVR gives you information which to me is beyond any other lead uh, as far as the limb lead goes. So, AVR is a camera which is looking from the right arm. AVL is a camera which is looking from the left arm. Lead 1 is looking at the lateral part of the left ventricle, it's right here. Lead 3 is the right leg, lead 2 is the left leg and AVF is coming down straight. I will tell you the relevance of this, this is very important diagram. Now the AVR looks from the right side, so it looks, we are talking about the left ventricle, we forget about the right ventricle at the moment, we talk about the left ventricle. If a camera is looking at the left ventricle, AVR will look at the upper part of the septum of the left ventricle. That is the basal part of the septum. Now those who have good knowledge of echocardiography will know that the basal part of the septum is the last one to get involved. Why? Because you need to uh, impede the supply from many areas to cause this to dysfunction. So if AVR is showing you changes, you are sure that this is the basal septum which is getting involved. And this is really an important thing. Now, going by the same con connotation, if we have lead 3 here, if there is a current of injury moving towards that territory, you would have ST elevation in that territory. For example, if this was an inferior wall infarction, so inferior wall would be on this side, it would be more on the diaphragm, so the vector moves like this towards right side, that means it moves towards lead 3. This is tells you that the right coronary is involved. While if in, with the same inferior wall in function, if the circumflex <coughs> is involved, you will have the vector moving towards this side. So one will be elevated and lead two will be elevated more than lead three. In right coronary artery, lead three, ST elevation will be much more than lead two because the vector is moving like this. Circumflex, the vector is moving like this. So from this ECG of an inferior wall in function, you will tell whether this is circumflex or it is a right coronary artery. For example, in this ECG, you have lead 3 much more than lead 2. Here you have lead 2 much more less than lead 3. And you have an ST depression in lead 1 because the vector is moving away from lead 1. Now lead 1 is a lateral lead. In circumflex, you can never have the vector move away from the lead 1. So if you just look at 1, 2, 3, you can tell whether it is circumflex or whether it is a right coronary artery. Not very difficult. Again, I said cardiologist, we get very simple things to actually treat. Uh, this is a patient who uh, you would see clearly that lead 1 does not show much change. Lead 2, lead 3. Lead 3 more than lead 2. No change in V5, V6 or v lead 1. It tells you this is right coronary artery. And clearly this RCA is blocked here. Okay. You can get down to telling proximal, mid, distal coronary artery, circumflex, mid or proximal, but let's forget about that at the moment. Let's look at one more ECG.
shows you lead 1 is ST depression. So the vector is moving away from lead 1, cannot be circumflex artery. Lead 3 is more than lead 2, so it has to be right coronary artery. But there is one very interesting thing in the CCG that you have an ST elevation in V1. Now V1 is a right sided lead. So V1 ST elevation will happen only if there is a right ventricular involvement. And the right ventricular involvement can only come if there is an RCA occlusion proximal to the RV involved branch. And the RV branch arises in the mid coronary artery. So this has to be a very proximal RCA to cause this kind of an ST elevation in V1. So V1 adds to the value of uh, the testing. Now this is also very important which ECG which I am going to show you. And this is a patient uh, whom, who actually died. This is a patient who had post-operative post-op CABG, came in the night with this ECG, uh, you would see there is atrial fibrillation, so the concentration went on atrial fibrillation, less concentration of, on these ST depressions and AVR. I keep coming to AVR because it's a very important disease. Now, you just look at this AVR, this ST is a little bit high, it's just one millimeter high. The heart rate is not so fast because this patient was adequately beta blocked because of his atrial fibrillation. So he had chronic atrial fibrillation and was adequately beta blocked. He came with chest heaviness and breathing difficulty. So as usual protocols were followed but this was not taken good care of. And then you look at ST depression in anterior. Now we don't know exactly why he died because he died in the night so I don't know exactly his angiogram was not done but when we looked at the CCG it clearly told me that there was involvement of a large territory because this AVR was involved and with this marked ST depression this patient actually had severe ischemia and should have been angiogrammed the same night. So again the ECG points to the fact that how early this patient should have been intervened. Was this? this was 78 years. Okay, now this is a young 32 years old man. Now, this patient came to me on the, in the OPD and he had come to the emergency room a day prior to our emergency and sent home because his first CART test was negative and he, there was this ECG which was sent as unremarkable, his 32 year old pain was not so typical. Now let's look at this ECG very carefully. You have an ST depression in V5, V4, V5, V6. You have ST depression in 2, 3 and AVF and you look at carefully at V2 this is flat and then the ST depression starts. So V3, V4, V5, V6 showing you ST depression. So this patient with this ECG went home and I knew what the problem was. We admitted him and found the problem which I am going to list here. So there are pitfalls in diagnosis of ST elevation. A significant number of patients with true acute complete occlusion of an epicardial artery which Warrants and emergent revascularization are actually not revascularized. Why are they missed? They are missed because of the misinterpretation of the presenting ECG. One of the universal definitions of MI, guidelines changed in 2012 to include some patients who in lead V1 to V3 especially have an ST depression when associated with a positive terminal T wave this is considered now as an ST elevation MI. Let's go back to that ECG. Now, if you look carefully at this ECG, V1 generally does not show a, a positive T wave. V1 generally has a negative T wave, which is very common. V2 also has a flat or a negative or a borderline T wave. See the peaking of this T wave in V2 and then an ST depression clearly tells you that this is a circumflex exclusion and truly Next day when we did the angiogram, the circumflex was true, true, totally occluded. We opened it and uh, uh, some damage had already been done to his myocardium. But fortunately, it did not develop any marginal rigor, so did well. So this is very important to understand that we must look at ECG more carefully. This ECG has uh, an ST elevation in V5, V6, so it clearly tells you this is circumflex. But why I have brought this ECG is that sometimes you will get ECG with only ST depression in V1, V2, V3 with a positive terminal 
T wave. You may not get this ST elevation. And this is enough for you to realize that this is an ST elevation MI and non in, not a non-ST elevation MI. This difference is very clear. What you can actually do is record V6, uh, apart from V6, record V7, V8. You may get some ST elevation because these are the posterior leads. A circumflex is a posterior uh, territory. So what happens is the vector is moving anteriorly. So when the vector is moving anteriorly, it will not cause ST elevation. So you will get ST depression in the anterior leads, right? So that's how you get the opposite of what you should see in an ST elevation MI. But it, it connotates that the artery is completely occluded, you should thrombolize or should resort to angioplasty. See this ECG and see this ECG after angioplasty in the same patient. You see the T wave in V2, V3. They are positive. The ST has gone because it has been promptly revascularized. The ST elevation has gone here. But T wave tells you that this was in current of injury. This is not negative. It's positive. Now let's look at AVR as one of the important indicators. So what happens in AVR is that you have current of injury which is moving upwards. So when the vector of current moves upwards, it tells you that there's an injury on the basal part of the septum. So when the vector is moving upwards, we also call, call this as heavily pointing vector, you will get ST elevation in AVR and ST depression in 2, 3 and AVF. Because the vector is going upwards, so you have ST depression 2, 3 AVF and ST elevation in AVR. This tells you that this patient needs serious attention and needs to be uh, treated differently from other patients. Let's look at this ECG. This is clearly an ST elevation MI, but you see V2, V3 having ST elevation. And you see 2, 3 and AVF marked ST depression. And look at AVR, slight amount of ST elevation. This tells you this is the place of activity, left main or proximal, very, very proximal area. Must get an urgent intervention to prevent a death. There is nothing as reciprocal. The vector is moving upwards, so the inferior leads will have an ST depression. So the reciprocal changes is not the word to be used now. <coughs> On the other hand, let's look at this ECG. This ECG shows the 2, 3 and AVF have slight ST which is going up. And V1 to V4 have an, a marked ST elevation. Some people may think this is really horrifying that you have ST elevation in inferior and the anterior leads. So that means the vector is moving downwards in addition to the anterior leads. That means it is the distal part of LED which is blocked, not the proximal part. To get a proximal LED block, you will have to have a, a marked ST depression in the anterior leads. Okay, this is good. I was thinking it may not come. This is a patient who is a classic example of how things really work. So in my unit, my juniors are very well trained, so they know what things are. So I was in a procedure in the lab, it was about 9.30, 10 o'clock in the morning, and my junior said that I'm shifting one patient. I said, what happened? He says that um, this is an IS officer. He went for a walk, had some chest heaviness. He's asymptomatic at the moment, but this is the ECG. So this is the ECG. Uh, you would see the 2, 3, AVF showing some ST depression. AVR, that slight ST elevation, and a peaked T wave in V2. This tells me clearly a proximal LED and a proximal circumflex are at involved likely to be a left main disease. Immediately the patient was in the lab and this is what the angiogram was. The proximal LED is gone completely. Immediately wired, you see a big aneurysm at the distal portion of the left main. And look at circumflex, very big, <coughs> tight osteal lesion. This patient in, would not have survived, I'm quite certain about it, would have worsened very fast if he was not in the cath lab. And this is after the stent. And he is doing well. This is one year follow. But just look at this ECG. This ECG is done all very serious. It looks that 
maybe let's work him up, let's do an echo, let's do troponin. We did nothing. We saw this area, mild ST depression in pyrrolites, telling you the vector is heavily pointing. There's no doubt about it. And this patient is in the lab immediately. This is the ECG of the same patient after the angioplasty. You see the <coughs> inferior leads gone completely, no ST elevation in area, the area looks totally different than what it was. And the C wave which was peaked in V2, V3 is no more peaked. So very clear change. And this is within minutes. It's not that it took so much time. It's in the first ECG in the, in the uh, ICU after the angioplasty. And this is the next day, you would see now a biphasic T wave and T wave inversions which set in, uh, telling you that how reperfusion changes develop over a period of time. So, whenever you reperfuse, whenever you use thrombolysis, you also try to look at the ST resolution, which is very important. So, there is a lot of confusion. After the thrombolysis, when should I send my patient for a, a angioplasty? Has he reperfused? Has he not reperfused? Of course, chest pain is a very important sign, but you should do repeat an ECG at least at 90 minutes, at least. There should be an ST resolution of more than 70% and in anterior MI, probably more than 50%, which tells you there is reperfusion. T wave inversion occurring within first four hours after reperfusion is a very specific sign of reperfusion. You should be happy about it. I like I showed you some T wave inversions. I'm very happy if a patient who had an ST elevation now has a T wave inversion. And then onset of idioventricular rhythm or some reperfusion arrhythmia. Uh, VTVF are not reperfusion in general. If VTVF happens, it happens very transiently, then it disappears. So if they are continuously present, you should be very worried. This patient was a patient of atrial fibrillation, heart failure, on multiple drugs, came with chest pain and here unfortunately our emergency room diagnosis was an MI, hyperacute MI, patient was shifted to the lab but one thing which was missing is that the potassium level was not done. So you can get this hyperacute this patient was an aldactone and his potassium at this stage was 7. So just correction of potassium was all that was needed to treat him. So if we had to diagnose MI uh, in this present era, uh, I think um, ECG is the key along with troponin levels. And if one can have an echo machine in the ICU or the, or the emergency room, it's a great boon. So I can show you some more couple of cases and then we can go on for whatever discussion we want. Um, let's look at some couple of cases, just two of them and then we can do some interesting cases. This is a 61 year old gentleman with the dyspnea on exertion for 5-6 days. This patient I did about, we came to us with 9 months back. His stress echo was positive and um, on the day of admission he had rest angina so was taken to the hospital and we had underwent an angiogram at about 9.30 at night. Now if we see this angiogram, this is the left main artery, this is an ulcerated plaque in the left main artery. There is a tight stenosis in the left main artery. Then there is the LED, a ramus big, and a circumflex which is small. If you look at another view, um, it becomes clear that this is the left main. There is a tight ostium of the LED which is stenosed, and then this LED goes down. This is the big ramus here and this is what it is. So the discussion here is, the first question is whether it should go for surgery or whether it should go for angioplasty. So if we look at the criteria that defines this, uh, the, these two procedures, um, 
here is a, uh, actually a trifurcation stenosis because there are three big branches coming out from this. There is ostium of LED which is involved. There is ulceration at the distal end of the left main. In a relatively young patient, 61 years is not a very old age. Uh, patient does not have any comorbidities. So probably with a big LED of that nature, a lima graft and a graft to ramus would be the most ideal situation in uh, such a tricky situation, uh, tricky angina. So I wouldn't have been showing it if this was what the answer was. So we decided that this patient is bad enough for uh, angioplasty procedure and uh, we should go for surgery. But looking at this anatomy, uh, I thought let's put in an IEPP and then uh, talk to the family and then we go ahead with the surgical procedure tomorrow morning. So this catheter was exchanged and an intraortic balloon pump was inserted and I was in the control room wanting the family to come because I had to go to the other room. So the family members were taking time while I was sitting in the control room. So we decided that let's shift the patient. But while we were thinking of shifting the patient, uh, he crashed. His ST elevation, he developed marked ST elevation. I don't have an ECG because we had no time. His pressures, which were 130, 140, dropped to uh, 60, 70, then 40. Now I had a balloon pump on the right side. I had no excess except a balloon pump. So on a cardiac massage, we punctured his left femoral artery and put in the guiding catheter. When I put in the guiding catheter, this left main was occluded at this point. You see a, a dissection and see the tip of the catheter is almost there. So this lifted that plaque and uh, that plaque, which is already ulcerated, probably closed off. And the left main was occluded and that was the cause of all the problem. So with that, we put in a, I put in a guiding catheter and uh, just crossed the circumflex and the flow came back. Uh, fortunately, the massage wasn't required, the pressures came up, but it was extremely difficult to get the wire across LED. And every time I tried to attempt to get the wire across LED, uh, the, the left main would occlude. So I had no choice. I had a patient which is, would die if I don't do anything. So I put in a stent from here into the ramus rather than putting the LED. So left the LED um, block like that because I wanted to, to save him there on the table. So I put the stent in the circumflex through this and uh, you would see this is a tight stenosis in the ostium of the LED and the wire would, was finding it difficult to go. Now it's a little bit more easier because I had a track with a stent closing off this direction and was able to cross uh, this uh, LED, put in a balloon and put in another stent uh, in, the, in the LED left main and uh, did a final kissing. This is after the final kiss and you see the, the left main lesion is gone. This ST, osteal LED has been very well stented. And this patient has completed nine months follow up with the stress echo which is negative, ejection fraction which is normal. There was no infarction at all in this particular patient. So uh, an emergency stenting of the left main with a, with a, um, a massive crash in the cath lab because of a ulcerated plaque in the left pane. And this patient had a normal ECG to start with. It did not have any changes. So this can be so dangerous, uh, a short history and uh, such a tight lesion. I'll show you one more case. Okay, this is the patient, those who understand echocardiography, this will be very interesting for us. This is the patient of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. You see uh, this part of the septum is normal. This part of the ventricle, lateral ventricle, this is the LV. So this part is also normal, but from here to here is the disease process. What is the disease process? This is hypertrophy. You see this hypertrophy. And then there is a bulge. And then there is something here at the apex. So this is an apical form of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. I will run this. You see this aneurysmal apex and, uh, and a normal looking basal part of the ventricle. So this patient had an apical hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. He had one history of ventricular tachycardia, so he got a, a defibrillator for the VT. And this is the echo. So clearly the apex 
is anurismal and non contracting. And these are the PVCs. Now, you see this PVC, you would see that lead 1 is negative, two, 3 area negative, this basal V1 to V6, V1 to V3 is positive, telling you that is arising from the left ventricle. And this would be the rapid VT, which was similar, which is very unsimilar to the PVCs, but he would develop this kind of VT. And then he would develop VF, this is VF, the defibrillator would shock him and get him into sanitation. And on that particular day, he got 15 shocks from his devices because he had 15 ventricular tachycardia. 15 times he had VT, which would degenerate into VF. So he got 15 shocks from the device. So what do we do? So we took him to the lab. VT was easily reducible. We could get the VT very fast. And so we mapped it. And this is a 3D mapping, which is a voltage map here. This purple color tells you this is normal voltage. This color tells this is at the mitral valve. So this is the mitral base, which has different colors. So this has been marked as the mitral annulus. And there are no colors beyond this. So this is all gray. This is all scar. There's no electrical activity at this point uh, here in this aneurysm. So this was mapped further. And you see this is the uh, ICD lead. These are the multiple leads. And this is an LV angiogram of the same patient. You would see this uh, apex, it's bulging, not contracting at all. And look at this part, uh, which is, this part of the left ventricle is hypertrophic and hypercontractile. So we mapped here, uh, so this dot is, this is a 3D map, so it's non-fluoroscopy, so there's no fluoroscopy here. It runs, you can see the catheter as a green dot, so the, this is the catheter which is moving. And this is giving an ablation current here. These dots are ablation. So I'm drawing a line and completing the line up to the apex. And this VT terminates with this uh, ablation. You see this VT goes away. And this is the same frame that VT during ablation goes away at this point of current. This is the line all along the aneurysm of uh, the ablation and the post Ablation patient was in sinusism, not even a single PVC. One year follow up, uh, no discharges from the ICD. So, this is one case that I could show you. So, I think we can have questions and then we can finish off uh, with the dinner. Important question, I have slides on that, but I would answer it without the slides. Um, this is actually very uncommon for a ST elevation MI to have left bundle branch block. Right. A patient who has an underlying left bundle branch block can now develop an ST elevation MI. So this this guidelines have really confused us as physicians that left bundle branch block should be an equivalent of an estillation. It isn't. There is no question about it. So where should we bother to look for an acute infarction? Is you should have an ST elevation in leads which do not have a big S wave. That means if you have an R wave in V5, V6, if you have an ST elevation in that territory, you know this is an infarction. If you have an S wave in V1 to V4 and you have some ST elevation, in left bundle branch block. This is unlikely to be an acute infarction. So this is important. The second thing is in the limb leads, any ST elevation with LBBB is significant. So LBBB is never an equivalent. Actually, it's one of the rarest causes to have left bundle branch block in ST elevation. Most of the times it is a patient has a pre-existing left bundle and now develops a new ST change. In fact, if Ischemia causes left bundle branch block, it is really sinister because left bundle has extremely good blood supply, unlike right bundle. So it's extremely sinister that you have QRS broadening with ischemia. That means it's a really terminal event. 
So it's a big uh, wrong on the part of guidelines to confuse physicians that a new onset left bundle branch block is equivalent of an ST lesion MI. It isn't. That was, that was a guideline previous. Sir, talking about the ST elevation, four types of ST elevation. The convex, which is synonymous with the stem. The concave with Rugata 1. The saddle shape with Rugata 2 and pericarditis. And the absorbing, which is a benign thing. So, how far is that true? Okay, so first I will interrupt you that uh, upsloping is no more uh, benign phenomena. Uh, it is now being investigated extensively and uh, this J point elevation is now uh, changed from what was called as uh, benign to what is called now as an early repolarization syndrome and has been associated with sudden death. There are some markers on the ECT which help you to distinguish benign ST J point elevation from malignant form of J point. So this is become actually a marker of sun death. So this is a very important sign. Uh, as far as so other sun absorbing is a marker of sun death. Did you say that? Yes, the early repolarization syndrome, which is J point elevation, was at one point thought of as sun not to be, yeah. not to be. There are some markers. There, there are some genetic markers which can indicate that. Thing. Now, as far as MI and pericardite is concerned, it's the pattern of ST elevation which leads. The clinical history, all that is very important. The temporal change of ST, all that is extremely important. And uh, it's not so difficult actually to distinguish. Sir, uh, talking about the cardiac markers, myoglobulin is the earlier to rise, but it's not specific. So, troponin flies in about 3 to 4 hours and remain high for about 10 days. But the CPK flies in 3 to 4 hours and remain high for about yeah, probably if you are looking at reinfarction, CPK is more important because it it falls faster than uh, troponin. So you also talk about the earlier you see uh, that hyperacute T wave changes. So those changes are the earliest changes for an encounter with an acute MI, but seldom seen. No. By the time the patient reaches the hospital, these changes are gone. Is that due to the uh, local hyperkalemia which occurs? No, no, no. They are changes very specific of uh, ischemia. They are not just hyperkalemia. Hyperkalemia may be one of the contributory yeah, factors yes. in the in the cellular pathology, but they are very specific for ischemia. They occur very early, so many patients are not picked up, but we have seen enough patients to say that one should recognize this and act early. Sir, my last question to you. Uh, just talk about the pathological two ways. So, what is a Q wave actually? What, what do you want to look from a Q wave is, is the infarction old or new? This has become irrelevant if the patient is having chest pain and develops abrupt, uh, you've done an angioplasty and quickly develops a Q wave, actually it tells you that the, the area has reperfused. So, as a relevance of old or new infarct, it is of no significance. Its relevance is with clinical history. So. Q waves may not be there, you may just have blunting of R waves from V1 to V4 which is equivalent of Q waves. So the relevance is not there, again there. So all you understand from Q waves is that probably this patient had an infarct, whether it is new or old, not sure. Uh, inferior leads may have Q waves which may be normal for that particular patient. But you have to compare it to the R wave height to decide whether this Q wave is significant. Sooner or later, something will, will turn up with something which you are looking for. Sir, of the hard point in ECG, when we are interpreting it, of all the changes, ST elevation, 
just not based on um, uh, ECG, it has to be based on history and troponin levels. So it could be any of them. So specificity varies, like ST elevation has the maximum specificity, T wave inversion has the least specificity. It's the specificity which varies, but all of them can make you diagnose in myocardial infarction. ST depression with a positive troponin with the history is MI. T wave inversion with a positive trim is MI. So all of them could be MI, the specificity varies. ST elevation, you don't need to do troponin, you're so specific, you just have to treat. Dr. Susi talked about the significance of Q-wave and what should be the depth of the Q-wave as compared to the R-wave. I would like to draw your attention and everybody's attention to the fact of what we call as salty wave. Now, what is a salty wave by definition? And in how many weeks should we have a salty wave? A salty wave is a single lead. Generally, we won't get tall wave in uh, one lead. So, at least two to three leads have to be uh, have to have that tall wave, and it has to be more than 11 millimeter to be qualifying for. Or has it to be more than the corresponding R wave? Is it still an R T wave? If you have an R wave and a very tall T wave, uh, T wave, it's even more significant than having an S wave and a T wave, tall T wave. More significant because it's the other way. The vector should go other way. If R wave is very tall. You don't expect the T wave to be there because the vector will go down much. So you talked about acid depression and Dr. Sari talked about the reciprocal changes. And you said there's nothing for the reciprocal change. If we have ST depression all the leads, what does that for us? So if you have ST depression in all leads, there will be one lead which is AVR, which will have an ST elevation. It tells you there is basal septum which is normal. So this is a very, very sinister kind of yes, thing. And we have to be very careful. Say so you mentioned about LVB, and in practice many of us see LVB, which have been coming us coming to us for years together. And you said a new onset LVB is sinister. But what about an LVB which is already there on the ECG and we do not know the origin? Since how long the LVB is there? We submit the patient for angiography, the angiogram is normal, and the cardiologist tells us it is not a congenital LVB. It's a more than acquired LVB. What is the significance of that LVB? Okay. And how should we uh, prognosticate the patient and how should we follow, follow him up? Okay, now LBP has been discussed, so I must get you to something on LBP. Okay, let's see this patient. This is a patient who is a um, member of parliament from Rajasthan from uh, Madhya Pradesh. So I had done his LED stent about seven years back. This patient was doing well, his ejection fraction was 30 percent. He off you Kadir. Lights down. LBP khadami karte because there has been good discussion. Sir, changes and fresh LBP are They are important. Important. Okay, now this patient, uh, uh, this is the ECG which shows the QRS, this is the normal science QRS which is about 120 milliseconds and then you see uh, some kind of an ectopic beat. This patient was thought to have new onset LBP because this QRS was very narrow and now that physician thought it was uh, broad, so broader, so he thought that this is LBP. So he gave him T and K because this patient had an LED stent and he had breathlessness so he gave him T and K. Then he was airlifted to us with the intracranial bleed and he lost him. Now why should we be bothered about left bundle branch block? Because, one second. slides but I have one second 
Anyway, I think we should discuss left bundle branch block one of these days because I have, I want to actually, there's so many myths about left bundle. Let me, let's get down to LBB. LBB has, has two significant values. First value is LBB is never normal. There is nobody who says that he had, the patient had LBB, his echo is normal, so he's normal. There's no one. LBB will connotes abnormality. The patient will be either hypertensive, he will have a scar, he will have a gold infarction. Second myth is that acute infarction causes new onset LBB. It doesn't cause. You will have to have some kind of an ST elevation to cause an ST elevation MR. You can have a pre-existing left bundle branch block and then now the troponin can rise and can cause an MI or you can have ST elevation with LBB. To cause ischemia to cause LBB has to involve a large territory, large multi vessels to cause LBV, which generally does not happen. But if such a situation is there, it has a sinister prognosis, very bad prognosis. So LBV is like that. The last question, sir. Many times we think that the classical example of LBV is a broad bizarre complex in ankles, ADHD, 4B, 5, and B3. And probably a W pattern in B1 and B2. But many times we don't have that classical pattern. And we actually have a combination of LASP and LBHP. Is it possible? What is LBB? So the septum is here, like this. Um, the movement is from the left to right of the current. If you have left bundle branch block, this movement from left to right will not happen. So what will happen? Lead one is looking from here. So what will happen to lead one? So if this activity goes from left to right, it will have an R1. V1 is here. If this activity goes, the R wave in V1 will go. It will have a very small R wave and a block. V5, V6 will lose the Q wave and will have a notching in the R. So to say that somebody has an LAB, LAHB and LPHB, I don't know, will have led, it will not happen. You have to have QRS more than 120. So you have to have a broad and bizarre complex. You cannot have. You cannot have left bundle branch block without more than QRS more than 120. You cannot have LBV without the septal activation being abnormal. I just wanted to clear that for myself. Yeah. Thank you. We can have a talk on left bundle branch block earlier today. Right, so stenting in left main is reserved. 
the moment in those who have uh, comorbidities, not surgically fit or extremely old age groups or have just austere left main, have just mid left main. These are the patients whom, who can be taken. But generally, surgery still holds true. Yeah, I have not got the question right. What if we get the stress of cardiomyopathy or can we get the stress of cardiomyopathy as well? Because most of the time we go to go for the either the uh, NICU or we go for the uh, CCU in which we are RT. So mostly we used to see the stress of okay. cardiomyopathy. Right. So stress induced cardiomyopathy is, uh, can produce all kinds of changes, particularly the fact that many of these patients are high dose of vasopressors where this will happen to the maximum. Uh, we had one patient this Sunday, not very far off, who had classical changes of an ST elevation in inferior leads and with a LV ejection fraction of 20%. ST elevation in inferior leads and ST depression laterally. So we thought circumference, in fact, had a normal curvy. And she was a neuro patient on vasopressors uh, because of low blood pressure and she was classical stress induced. So stress induced cardiomyopathy can produce all kinds of changes which can be bizarre. What about the troponin, sir? Is it troponin sometimes is increasing the stress of cardiomyopathy? It, it, yes, right. It, but it will not be like what it rises in myocardial fact. You won't see that temporal rise and fall of uh, troponins in myocarditis, in stress induced cardiomyopathy. They will be mildly elevated, but they will stay like that. In in a MI, you start with mild elevation, then the peak. This peak will not happen in uh, stress induced cardiomyopathy. You repeat a sample six hours later, you won't get a rise. Do you think the neonatal stress induced cardiomyopathy is very common? Because uh, we used to see the uh, neonatal as well with units in which also the EF is very low during uh, performing the echocardiography, sir. I have no experience with neonates. Uh, what about the early progress? How much are the chances of early progress to convert in the MI, sir? No. for some time but uh, practically always remains there so last question Dr. Manish sir I think Rita sir already said Rita left man why why do Rita CLVT over ATCL you saw this this was distal left man so because there are three branches this is a trifurcation stenosis so when you stent one you get the other branch which gets compressed so then you have to put another stent to that branch so that means you're putting a stent through a stent in an area if the stent closes, you can end up in a deadly catastrophe. So that's why when you have multiple stents at bifurcation, the risk of restenosis or thrombosis is high. And thrombosis or restenosis in these areas is lethal. Is it related to the left vein is more elastic so far It is nothing to, it is elastic but it is not Distal left main is because there are multiple branches. Yes, sir, the last question. Sir, my question is that we have got many signs of about FFR. So, how do you use FFR in the specific in the last case we had difficulty in transporting the LAD block and it was better to stand or not? When he had a crash and after that he went in, would FFR have solved from there? Nothing. This is not a case for FFR. What is FFR? FFR is fractional flow reserve. So what it tells you is that is this lesion 
likely to be hemodynamically significant or not. So it is meant for lesions which are say 50 to 70 percent in nature. So you do the FFR, if FFR is low, that means this lesion could be higher than what you predict. Because by doing an angiogram, it's a liminal angiogram, so you could miss. Here you have 99 percent stenosis, there is no question. So, uh, friends, uh, if you have more questions, no more questions, let's put a together for the